sons of thunder. That's the name given by Jesus to James and John in our Bible lessons, the son of Zebedee, as it talks about in the gospel lesson today. James and John were one of the first disciples that Jesus called at the beginning of his ministry. Sons of thunder. You know, that's kind of an awesome name, isn't it? I mean, it'd, be make a, it'd make a great name for a motorcycle gang or for a rock group or something like that. But James and John didn't like it too well. They wanted to be called something else. They wanted to be known as James and John the Great. That's why they went up to Jesus and said, Hey, teacher, why don't you do for us whatever we ask of you? Are they being presumptuous? Yes. Narcissistic? Probably. Out of line? Absolutely. You might want to shake your head at their arrogance and think that this request is totally out of line, but you know when you are great or think that you're great, a question like that's not out of the question at all. I mean, look at the most recent presidential candidates. I mean, if you don't think you're great, you probably don't run for the highest office of the land. And for the longest time, they've been uh, asking their rich donors to do for them whatever they ask. And most of the time, those donors just get out the checkbook and do for them whatever they ask. What does that tell you about the presumptuous behavior? It's not, getting, it's not being um, uh, discouraged here in the United States. It seems like it's being encouraged instead. So James and John say to Jesus, Jesus, how about having one of us sit on your right and the other of us on your left when you come into your glory? They want to have one of those excellent cabinet seats in the upcoming messianic kingdom of God. Nothing would make them happier than to, for people to walk up and see Jesus and then see both of them on either side of Jesus as well. But there's a problem, really two big problems with being great. One is that greatness leads to a life of illusion, and it can also lead to a state of confusion. The illusion is that you're more invincible, more powerful, more righteous than you are. And the confusion is that you really don't know the true meaning of greatness. Last Sunday, we began again and picked up with our, the story, um, the sermon series again with the story. And since it was Christmas time last week, we looked at the birth of Jesus Christ. Today, as I mentioned, we start with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It began with Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, where the heavens split over and open, and something like a dove descends on Jesus. And then a voice sounds out that, This is my son, the one that I love. Y'all should listen to him. Yeah, God was Southern. Um, Y'all should listen to him is basically what he was telling the people there. And what they saw and what they heard and what they experienced with the ministry of Jesus wasn't what they expected. What Jesus did in his ministry wasn't what the teachers and the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching and the people and believing themselves about the coming messianic kingdom of God. It wasn't what the disciples expected, which is why we have this conversation as our gospel lesson this evening. And it's still not what people today expect or often seek when they look for the kingdom of God. But as you read through chapter 23 of the story and see how the ministry of Jesus unfolds from his baptism to the calling of the disciples to the beheading of John the Baptist to his conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, there's one thing that just keeps coming up again and again and again. 
And that's the idea that the kingdom of God is countercultural. The kingdom of God is, uh, is inside out. It's backwards. It's upside down from what the world expects. And the focus of Jesus' ministry was on those man-made rules that excluded people, that debased people, that left people out of the kingdom of God. Notice in Jesus' ministry that he never breaks civil law and never advocates the breaking of civil law. So the protesting that's going on in Ferguson and New York City and other places, he would not have any part of that at all. Jesus was focused on those things that kept people out of the kingdom of God. And the elites at that time, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rulers, couldn't take it because their greatness was bound up with their power. And what Jesus was teaching the people was that greatness is not found in position or power, but in something else. Greatness has that life of illusion. Throughout history, there are many people who have been described as the great. But even those people have their weaknesses and blind spots. Alexander the Great, Macedonian king, 4th century B.C., conquered the Persian Empire, controlled land from southern Europe, throughout Persia and the Middle East, throughout northern Africa. Thought he was invincible, but history tells us that he was done in by a lowly mosquito. Died of malaria at the age of 32. Then there's Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia from 1762 to 1796. Her fame was bound up in the modernization of Russia and the expansion of the territory of Russia and also that she began the first school for girls. But she wasn't a all that powerful. In fact, her power didn't come until her lover in a coup deposed her husband. And then there's Ramses the Great, Pharaoh of Egypt, from 1279 to 1213 B.C. He was the one who built the pyramids, the temples, the cities, the monuments. But the Bible says he's not so righteous he was the one who enslaved the Israelites, the one that prompted God to put into place the plan for the Israelites to have to leave Egypt. History tells us again and again that greatness leads to a life of illusion, that people believe that they're more invincible, more powerful, more righteous than they are. The number one problem of greatness is a life of illusion. The second problem is the life in a state of confusion. And this Jesus tackles head on in his ministry. This is where Jesus comes to them and says to er, the, disi the disciples who came to Jesus, James and John, walk up to Jesus and Jesus and ask them to sit on the right and the left. And Jesus looks them squarely in the eyes and says to them, Do you really know what you're asking? Can you drink the cup I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I am about to be baptized with? Jesus senses that they're confused about what being great in the kingdom of God is all about. That they have no clue what they're asking, what's going to take to be in his kingdom of glory. Jesus is telling them it's not going to be coming through your position of power, but it's going to march straight through the wilderness of suffering. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? The cup of my blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. 
are you willing to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? A baptism of dying and rising where suffering and death comes before new life and a new creation. In a world of instant gratification like we live in, this kind of message is hard for us. We want to be a part of God's great, glorious kingdom, but we don't want the suffering. We don't want the pain that goes with it. So when Jesus asked James and John this question, James and John's come back with the answer, why, yes we can. But he still knows that they're confused. They don't know what they're asking. They're confused about the path to greatness. Jesus doesn't shoot them down, though. He agrees with them. He goes, yes, you will drink the cup that I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Jesus knows that the path, his path, leads to the cross through suffering. And he knows that everyone who follows in the footsteps of Jesus will have a similar path of suffering and a cross to bear themselves. The book of Acts tells us that James was put to death with a sword by King Herod Agrippa. John was exiled to the prison island of Patmos. You could say that they gave their lives to the faith and for the faith. But, as Jesus says, greatness in the kingdom, that's not for me to give. But Jesus doesn't leave us hanging as to what greatness is and where greatness can be found. He says, in this inside out, backwards, upside down kingdom of God, where greatness can be found, service. Service is the hallmark of greatness. Really appealing, isn't it, in our world? Really attractive, service, being a servant of other people. (laughs) It's ironic when the ten found out what James and John had done, they become indignant with them, start squabbling with them. And Jesus uses this squabbling moment as a teaching time to teach them where true greatness can be found. He begins by pointing out the way of the rulers of this world. He said, oh, those in position of authority here, they're tyrants. They'll lord it over you. They'll demand to be served, not, be, not to do the serving themselves. They'll want to be coddled. They'll want to be doted over. They'll want whatever they can get from you. But not so with you, says Jesus. Not so with you. If you want to be great In the kingdom of God, become servant of all. That's not what people want to hear. And since Jesus himself will not practice, will not teach what he himself won't practice, he uses himself as a model of the approach. He says, I came not to be served, but to serve to give my life as a ransom for many. Who was the greatest of all time? Where is greatness to be found? Not in Alexander, not in Catherine, not in Ramses, only in Jesus Christ, who served by giving his life for all. Jesus is the greatest servant of all times. As St. Paul so poignantly said, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While there was nothing in us to deserve his love, he gave it anyway. Even before we realized we needed saving, Jesus was sent. A servant does what is needed, and what was needed most by us is forgiveness. Through forgiveness, our relationship with our creator God is restored. Jesus took on himself the curse, our curse, the curse of sin, that curse of ours that wants us to be like God. 
that wants us to think of ourselves as great, that wants to scoot Jesus off the throne and plant ourselves there to be the servant, to be the one being served. But Jesus says, not so with you. The one who is servant is the greatest. Because you see, in following Jesus and in his kingdom, it's not so much about success as it is significance. Want to be great? Become least. Want to be first? Then get last. Want to find yourself? Then lose yourself. Define yourself less by what you have and more by what you give. Define the church less by how well we bring people in as by how well we send people out to live as citizens of God's kingdom in this inside out, backwards, upside down world that God has in his kingdom. That's not the criteria that the world uses when it focuses on the bottom line. But if we live according to God's word, if we listen to his word, we belong to a kingdom that will never end. So instead of living a life of illusion, know who you are. A fragile human being with, not, with limited power and righteousness. Rather than enduring a state of confusion, know where true greatness is found in service to others. Everyone can be great, said Martin Luther King Jr. in his letters from prison, because everyone can serve. He said, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make the subject and verb agree to serve, said Martin Luther King Jr. All you have to have is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. True for James, true for John, true for all of us who by God's grace are citizens of God's inside out, backwards, upside down kingdom. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.